Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for being here uh, with us. Uh, we are sure most of us have heard and probably felt the recent underwater volcano eruption in Tonga. We are praying for our Tongan sisters and brothers who are beset by tsunami waves and airborne ash stemming from the eruption. A tsunami alert is now in effect for the Fijian group. We've already issued warnings to avoid the shoreline due to strong currents and possibly dangerous waves. If you need to move to higher ground, please do so. Some evacuation centers are being opened up. We are also monitoring our air quality. As a matter of precaution, please cover all household water tanks and stay indoors in the event of rain due to the risk of rainfall becoming acidic. Today, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're talking through our ongoing response to Cyclone Cody, the re reopening of schools and some additional guidance on our COVID safe measures. But before we do so, we have an important update. This week, following a scheduled medical review in Melbourne, Australia, our Prime Minister was informed by his physician that he needed to undertake an urgent cardiovascular related surgical procedure. He underwent that procedure yesterday morning and we are very happy to report that it was a great success. He is now well on his way to recovery and in fact has already spoken with his family members. Per the doctor's orders, this type of surgery takes weeks at a minimum to recover from. So we expect to have our Prime Minister back at the helm of the nation, fitter than ever, by the end of next month. Uh, we'll take any questions that you have after this announcement in relation to that, but out of respect for his privacy and that of his family and the need for the Honourable Prime Minister to focus on his health, I'd ask we keep ourselves focused on the day's pressing business. Our economic recovery, ladies and gentlemen, which began in earnest at the start of December, could not have come soon enough as resurging government revenues are helping us mount a decisive response to the arrival of TC Cody. Most floodwaters have now subsided and initial damage assessments are well underway. Our Minister for Rural, Maritime Development and, Nas uh, and Disaster Management and who is also our Minister for Defence, National Security and Policing is in the north as we speak leading our response on the ground there and all our other ministers have been on the ground also. In total, we've uh, distributed nearly 1,000 food packs to families in need through NDMO. In addition, the Ministry of Economy reactivated our food pack distribution to individuals in flood-affected regions who are completing periods of self-isolation due to a positive COVID-19 diagnosis or COVID-like symptoms. Power electricity has been completely restored in the northern and central divisions with urgent un work underway to get back power online for the remaining areas of at least 1% in the western division. So the western division is 99% up. Water is restored mostly everywhere save the western division which is 95% of services restored. Our WEF engineers are at work clearing blockages to restore water throughout the west. As of, uh, 31, uh, of, sorry, as of 13 January all major roads have been reopened to tourists. Of course, there are certain low-level crossings that still have water uh, inundation. It is clear by every measure that the 14 cyclones we've experienced as a nation since 2016 are not the same storms our grandparents endured. Climate change is warming the world. It is warming our oceans. And those warmer waters give the, these storms more energy, making them more severe as they carry more rain and create more flooding. And that is why we must treat warnings of severe weather more seriously than we ever have. The science behind that phenomena is indisputable. It is not only testing human-made infrastructure, but the barriers built by nature. For example, a recent flooding in Nandi was mainly a result of the bursting of the riverbank, not because of any drainage issues, as some have claimed. Of course, we have to adapt regardless, and we are. And these are unprecedented storms brought by the unprecedented warming of the world. Building resilience takes energy, focus and resources, all of which we are dedicating. As we brace for more severe weather this cyclone season, there will likely to be other temporary service disruptions. Our teams from EFL, FRA and WEF are among the first to hit the ground as soon as the weather clears and they put in whatever hours are necessary and go through whatever or wherever 
is necessary to restore any service that are disrupted. And as they've done through the past 13 cyclones, they've struck before us, before Cody. All they ask for is, in return, our patience. Now, I would like to thank all of these frontliners for their dedication to the nation and to the well-being of their fellow Fijians during this crisis. TC Cody, ladies and gentlemen, was a wet storm, but not especially a windy one. We saw some limited structural damage to infrastructure, but no serious damage to the schools that we rebuilt to cyclone resilience standards after TC Winston. However, the flooding has been very tough on our farmers. Many of the fields have been inundated and the crops and livestock have been washed away. Our immediate priority is to help them grow back better to feed families here in Fiji and strengthen our agricultural exports, all of which strengthens our farmers' bottom line. Through a fast deploying cash for farmers program, we will provide $250 cash to all cyclone affected farming households for land preparation, cultivation, and procurement of planting materials. Our estimates show we have 20,000 households that will qualify. So we've allocated $5 million for this particular purpose. To apply for assistance, you must be a full-time farmer. Your farm must fall in the cyclone path of Cody and at least 30% of your crops or 10% of your livestock must have sustained damage. For all bilateral quarantine arrangements registered farmers, we will also provide seedling and fertilizer packages valued at $176. And in recognition of the importance of local community-based food security, we are announcing a new Grow From Home program that will distribute 20,000 home gardening seed packages to households in Fiji at a cost to the government of about $300,000. We'll publish details on how to apply to receive a household seed pack on the Fijian government Facebook page. Application forms, of course, and information will also go throughout the Ministry of Agriculture. The pandemic and the worsening climate crisis are both serious threats to the global food supply. We've seen that for ourselves in Fiji, as have billions of people around the world. So, very, so we very much encourage families to take advantage of this Grow From Home program. Start a garden, grow some of your own food, and help strengthen our national food and nutrition security from the grassroots up. In addition to the Grow From Home program, we'll be supplying an additional 20,000 farmers with $25 packages of seed, dry seed sorry, at a cost of $500,000. We are keeping, of course, a close eye on new weather systems developing to the southwest of the Fijian group. We don't expect another cyclone to form, but we do expect some wet weather systems. So let's, find, let's remind ourselves sorry, of what's necessary to stay safe. Stay out of the floodwaters, don't let children swim in them, and never risk crossing them. Use this time to shutter your homes and prepare emergency kits. Move livestock to higher ground. If you're ordered to evacuate or feel you should, please move to an evacuation center in daylight hours. We have well rehearsed protocols to ensure these facilities are COVID safe. The latest weather forecast and advice will be put on television, radio, and on the Fijian government social media pages. And we ask everybody to please stay safe. Our schools were closed this past week and they will remain closed until we assure the impacts of the eruption in Tonga have cleared our waters as we may need to uh, reactivate some of them, some of the evacuation centers. But let us also be clear, we plan to reopen our schools for years 8 to 13 once the weather situation clears up. Over the past eight months that our schools were closed, more than 200,000 children in Fiji lost more than 1,000 hours of in-person learning each. That is 200 million hours of lost in-person learning and we cannot afford many more. Supported by a clear COVID protocols for classroom safety, developed with UNICEF and WHO, the date for the reopening of schools for all the students will be announced once all evacuation centers are cleared and the warning on tsunamis and severe weather systems are lifted. As announced last week, ladies and gentlemen, we stepped up fines for violations of our COVID safe measures and included a new restriction on social gatherings. We understand the impact of the social gathering restriction has had for everyone, especially for weddings and other special occasions, which we all wish to share with friends and family. But we've implemented this temporary necessary measure to slow the spread of highly transmissible Omicron variant in spaces 
that we cannot effectively regulate. We are not announcing any additional health measures today, but we do have some additional guidance to announce on our informal social gathering restriction, specifically on how venues can become CARE Fiji certified so that they may host events at 80% capacity. We have two sets of protocols to announce. First are the protocols for what we call independent event halls and higher venues, which, halls, which apply to halls seeking to host events at 80% capacity. So your Lambert Hall, your, your Katri Hall, whichever halls that are there. The basic provisions remain intact. We are not introducing anything outside of the COVID safe measures that we continuously have emphasized, such as masking up, two meter physical distancing, habitual sanitizing, and proper ventilation. Adherence to these protocols will need to be signed off in order to obtain a permit to operate. Venue operators can apply for a permit to operate for independent event halls and venues on www.covidpass.mctt.gov.fj. We'll publish that email on the Fijian government Facebook page in case you, do not, uh, you weren't able to write that down. But it also, it's also for the public. Those venues which have been approved can host events, including weddings and other functions at 80% capacity, just as houses of worship, restaurants, hotels and re uh, resorts currently do. The Ministry of Commerce, Trade, Tourism and Transport, the Fijian Competition and Consumer Commission, the Fiji Police Force and the Ministry of Health and Medical Services are serving as what we call our COVID Safe Ambassadors or CSAs. The CSAs are out there guiding and where necessary issuing penalties whenever there is a breach of the protocols. Fijians who want to host events outside in an open air environment like in a shed in the village in the village green or rara as we call it or in the compound for example to host a wedding a funeral or birthday must ensure they are compliant with all COVID safe measures. You do not need a permit or any specific certification to host these events. We need to make sure that one, the event is at 80% capacity of the outdoor venue. Everyone must wear a face uh, covering at all times unless eating. Three, everyone maintains two meter distance. Four, there is no dancing except by, by the members of a hired dance group or live band. Five, strictly no sharing of utensils. Six, keep sanitizer or hand washing facility for guests. And seven, a register of all the guests with name and contact details are kept. Remember the protocols and measures are in place for a reason, to protect you and your loved ones, whilst allowing you to have some semblance of a normal life. Should you breach any of the protocols, CSA ambassadors can order the immediate closure of your function. And we will be randomly checking on these venues and events to ensure compliance. So to be clear, indoor events in venues with four walls with more than 20 people need a permit. Outdoor events do not need a permit, but the organizers must enforce COVID safe measures or they could actually be forced to close down those events or those particular uh, functions that they're having. Ladies and gentlemen, to wrap things up, we want to update everyone on where we stand on our economic recovery. We suffered a serious pandemic drive uh, driven blow in 2020 with the largest economic contraction ever of 15.2%. The Macroeconomic Committee recently released the revised economic growth numbers with a double digit growth projected for this year. This may be the highest ever growth experience in Fiji's history. This turnaround was only possible due to our concerted effort to secure vaccines early, effectively roll out those vaccines and reopen our borders and the economy. The economic uh, growth projections, let me highlight those by the Mac uh, Macroeconomic Committee, 2019 was minus 0.4 percent growth, 2020 minus 15.2 percent which is the largest contraction, 2021 a minus 4.1 percent contraction, 2022 11.3 percent growth, potentially highest growth ever. 2023, 8.5% growth, and 2024, 7.7% growth. At the end of 2021, foreign reserves stood at $3.2 billion, equivalent to 9.9 .9 months of import cover. This is the first major crisis during which we have not had a balance of payments, a foreign exchange problem, or indeed a devaluation. We entered the crisis with strong foreign currency, sorry, with strong foreign exchange holdings 
and managed to maintain a strong reserves position during the crisis. This is despite the closure of our largest foreign exchange earner, tourism, which brings in about $2 billion annually. That's why government also borrowed from external sources like ADB, World Bank, AIAB, JICA, and sourced budget support grants from Australia and New Zealand. Had government not borrowed externally, there would have been a very high risk of a devaluation. Imagine, ladies and gentlemen, devaluation during this crisis. It was avoided, and we avoided it. The reserves outlook is also very comfortable. Liquidity. At the end of 2021, liquidity stood at almost $2 billion. The high foreign reserves supported by the external government borrowings in helped increase liquidity, which has played a key role in supporting a low interest rate environment, which is critical for economic recovery, and therefore we will continue with that particular um, uh, situation. Imagine major spikes in interest rates. We carefully navigated these headwinds and thankfully karma seas now lie ahead. Debt to GDP ratio rose from 53.3% in 2006 to 56.2% in 2010. Following this, the debt to GDP ratio was on a steady downward path declining to 43.5% in financial year 2016-2017. This was a decline of close to 13% 13 percentage points in just over six years. Our commitment to fiscal prudence was clear. Then we had T.C. Winston and many other natural disasters that required additional, additional borrowing with the debt to GDP ratio rising to 48.4 percent in the years 2018-2019, still below the 50 percent GDP mark. Fast forward to the COVID-19 pandemic. Tax revenues fell by 50 percent on average every month. 12-month loss of over $1.4 billion. The economy experienced the largest ever contraction of 15.2% in 2020, loss of GDP equivalent to almost $2 billion. Government had to increase its borrowings to sustain public expenditures and provide over $500 million in unemployment support and other relief measures. This led to an increase in the level of debt. Apart from the increased borrowing, the decline in nominal GDP induced a sharp increase in the debt-to-GDP ratio. For financial year 2020-2021, the debt-to-GDP ratio would have been 14.4% lower if we assume nominal GDP remained at 2018-2019 levels, which is pre-COVID. Therefore, once the economy recovers to pre-COVID levels, debt-to-GDP uh, levels will fall. The alternative, we would like to remind everybody, of not borrowing and supporting the economy during the last 20 months would have meant the economic decline would have been much more severe, thus a much lower nominal GDP, and our debt-to-GDP ratio would have been in a far worse position. This is apart from the devastating impact we would have seen on the socio-economic front. It is clear that the counter-cyclical stance to support the economy with additional debt was appropriate, and this is why our multilateral partners supported Fiji with additional external debt during this period. The alternative was a mass destitution in Fiji. We avoided that. Our critics' short-sighted suggestions would have let the church economic crisis unfold unabated. Our largest foreign exchange earner, tourism, brings in about $2 billion in foreign exchange earnings annually. With tourism earnings almost completely shut down for 18 months, we ran a high risk of a large devaluation if government had not sourced the external debt and budget support from multilateral and bilateral partners and secured the foreign investment in Energy Fiji Limited. A devaluation in the middle of a crisis would have meant more uncertainty and would have made the crisis worse with many more severe socioeconomic challenges. Government securing the external funding, borrowings, budget support and EFL uh, divestment not only supported foreign reserve uh, levels, but helped increase the liquidity in the domestic market, which in turn reduced our interest costs on domestic borrowings. It also helped keep the interest rate environment low, which is critical for economic recovery, as stated earlier on. We secured over $700 million in highly concessional finance tagged to policy reforms with long-lasting impact. Some of it was at 0.01%. 
income support to unemployed and vulnerable. Throughout the pandemic, we've provided almost $500 million in direct income support. Uh, sorry, we've provided almost $500 million, of which $430 million was in direct income support and other relief measures of about $70 million. These included things like subsidies uh, on electricity, water, uh, access to GPs, food, uh, food rations. Uh, you know, payment of uh, uh, market vendors fees, fishing license fees, and other daily expenses. And of course, the interest rate payments from the $200 million loan facility. We of course started off with the formal sector through FNPF, and later extended the support to the informal sector. The fight, of course, we knew was a long one. And at many points, we had no idea how long it would last. So we had to ensure that the payout was sustainable. We stepped up efficiency in a big way, by adopting a digital application and payout system. Applications were processed in less than three minutes and disbursements followed immediately after that. We want to thank everyone who adopted these digital tools. We know it wasn't what all of you, of you were used to, but because you did and you used those systems, we were able to distribute payments quickly and write out a tough two years together. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, this in a nutshell is the uh, snapshot of the economy and, uh, and the other various matters that do affect us or uh, will be affecting us in the next few weeks and indeed the days. And uh, we wanted to give you a, a quick update on that. Uh, we'll now um, uh, be able to take any questions that you uh, may have. Please feel free to do so. Thank you. Mr. Kayum, thank you very much for that update. Um, not quite sure where to start. Uh, could you probably start with um, the tsunami situation and the warnings that have gone out. Uh, we've seen some reports come through on social media that there are some parts of the north, the east, and even Kandabo that have been affected. What is your information in terms of which communities are currently at risk, which communities have been affected, and what, is, what are the actions uh, that will mobilize soon to address this? Well, a number of uh, ministries and, of course, agencies are involved in this. Um, the Ministry of uh, Itauke Affairs, Minister of Rural and Maritime Development, uh, NDMO, of course, uh, Ministry of Lands and Mineral Resources. Um, we all, in the, even Ministry of Education, uh, we have seen requests now for some of the schools to be opened up as evacuation centers because some of the low-lying areas are being inundated with water. Uh, for example, we know of in, in uh, southern Lao Botoa and uh, Ona Ilau have been affected. Uh, so again, um, you know, the teams have reached out to them in terms of communicating with them as to what to do. Uh, we know that certain parts of Kandavu, there are also parts up in the Rewa Delta, we know that have been affected too. And there are some parts in, in the Northern Division. So warnings, as you know, the two warnings were given, one by the Lands and Mineral Resources and one also by the uh, NDMO, uh, you know, alerting everybody to move to higher ground and they need to do that. Evacuation centers will be, of course, uh, opened up uh, for them to on, on higher ground. So that's, that's the current situation. We've also had a discussion with the Ministry of Environment as I mentioned in the, state, in the statement, they're currently, uh, currently looking at the air quality too because there's some ash fallout, as you would have seen in the videos that have come out of uh, Tonga. Uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure most of you would have also seen the explosion that actually took place uh, under the ocean. You can see how immense it was. And in fact, uh, uh, one may say that Tonga was quite lucky in, in respect of the, the, the size of the waves uh, weren't as very large, but of course they have inundated many of the areas that could have also had an equally disastrous impact too. Um, so uh, it's an ongoing situation, it's a very fluid situation, uh, so to speak. Uh, I also had a chat with the, uh, the Minister for um, NDMO, they're also talking to Wellington uh, to see whether there'll be any other aftershock effects. So it's, like I said, it's very, very fluid, uh, but we are providing all the um, you know, support and uh, assistance to all the different ministries that are working together to ensure that we, first of all, save lives. And to date, we know that uh, nobody in Fiji has died uh, from any of these uh, you know, inundation of waters. Which agency is leading the response to this situation? Is it well, the NDMO? Where do people go to to get advice on how long these aftershocks might last? Uh, will the tsunami warning be ongoing? As, as with all natural disasters, your best uh, way of getting uh, your information is through the radio, uh, because uh, radio also, in particular the AM stations, as you know, the AM stations travel better over water, so they go all the way to Rotuma, the Kumbia, Southern Lao, etc. 
So all the warnings, all the different messages are given through the radio. Uh, you don't have to go anywhere physically, uh, but of course you ha you'll have to move physically if you need to go to higher ground. And uh, the situation with the Prime Minister, Mr. Eji, can you tell us, uh, have you spoken to him? What is the who is the chain of, who is leading the country now? When I'm the acting Prime Minister. And uh, of course we have the team of all the ministers. Uh, we are doing the job uh, as required. Nothing has stopped uh, happening. The Honourable Prime Minister, as we said, uh, he's spoken to his family members. Uh, as you would expect that when somebody goes through a... Uh, a particular medical procedure, they will speak to their loved ones first and we have other lines of communication open in respect to that. How long has he been away uh, as a result of this medical situation and have you spoken to him? How is he? I spoke to him before he went into his procedure, yes. So how long ago did he go away? Uh, a week ago. Uh, Mr. Tony General, uh, I'll just go back to the question regarding the Prime Minister. Um, just, uh, I think yesterday, uh, some of the media outlets in uh, New Zealand made some silly jokes regarding the Prime Minister. That uh, one was Ali Jones' uh, morning talk show, and as well the New Zealand, New Zealand Herald. They've uh, stated in their, uh, some of their statement that the Prime Minister had died. What do you have to say regarding this? Uh, Look, I mean, uh, I think most people in Fiji don't read the New Zealand media. Uh, unless they're propagating that from the uh, freelance journalists from here. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that, you know, I find it highly actually quite despicable and undignified uh, that we have the elected prime minister of a country uh, being treated in this manner on social media. And unfortunately, some of the journalists are part of that pro problem in Fiji also. And unfortunately, some of the politicians are part of that problem also, or their relatives living offshore. I know one of the posts that I've sent declared him to be dead. Uh, one of the ones who said that he had his surgery in Canberra, uh, you know, um, this is all ridiculous stuff. I, I, I cannot, you know, even fathom to think whether journalists would do so if, for example, tomorrow the Prime Minister of Australia had a surgery or uh, Arden had a surgery, that they would do that. They would not. So is it because we are Fiji and we not in the same league as Australia and New Zealand, so therefore our journalists, our politicians think that our Prime Minister could be treated that way? Is there some kind of racism there? Is there some kind of, you know, uh, that somehow people, elected Prime Ministers in the Pacific should be treated that way? It's preposterous. You should be asking those questions. And in fact, you need to go back to those media organizations and ask them those questions. We similarly had some, you know, terrible reports by ABC uh, previously, uh, you know, misinformation completely. You have people like uh, the freelance journalists over here who obviously live here but did not correct it. So this is the kind of standard of journalism we are getting, not just in Fiji, but also those in Australia and New Zealand when it comes to a country like Fiji, unfortunately. So with the measures that uh, are in place for indoor gatherings as well as outdoor gatherings, you've talked about people not to be sharing utensils and all. Uh, what about, uh, what is the stance of government in terms of, uh, you know, they'll be drinking grog and uh, they will obviously be sharing uh, the same grog bowl. What, what is your comment on that? Well, look, I mean, I uh, had a bowl of grog over the uh, New Year's time uh, in Naranga and everybody had their own bowl of grog, or had their own bowl, sorry. A lot more people are getting their own bowls. So, you know, people are adhering to that. And at the end of the day, uh, we cannot be next to everybody. There's a particular level of self-responsibility that people need to undertake. We have gone about, in all ways, you would have heard Dr. Fong, you would have heard the various messages that have been given out. Where we have the ability to have you know, various measures and protocols where it can be policed, the police officer cannot be everywhere. And they don't want to be everywhere. There's a particular level of responsibility. Um, I've just come back from Singapore uh, where you have people who actually, once the government gives out a message, everybody follows it because they know it's in their best interest. So we need to develop that culture. We cannot also at the same time then we're going holding everybody's hand. We're doing it for their good. And I think more and more Fijians are actually realizing that. I mean, I've, I've had sort of messages like yesterday from people saying, look, you know, I want to hold an outdoor event. 
uh, I, want, I will adhere to the 80%. Please let me know, do I need a permit or not? They don't need a permit. But they're quite happy. They said, we've done X, Y, Z. We've got hand sanitizers. You know, so people are being a lot more proactive. And we urge people to be proactive because it is actually for your benefit. Uh, you're not doing anybody a favor. You're actually doing a favor for yourself, uh, for your family members, for your community, for your economy, actually. Because we've opened up the borders. I mean, we've seen the delight on the look of all the uh, the delight on the faces of all the hotel workers. I mean, we, I met people yesterday, you know, there were people who keep the, the, the gardens, etc., one of the hotels, and they said, look, it's great. I'm now working, you know, five, uh, six days a week. Um, and he said, I'm you know, glad I'm, get, I'm getting money in my pocket. And he said, please don't close the borders. He said to me, please don't close the borders. I said, well, it's not, you know, everybody needs to adhere to it. And they're all adhering to it. So, you know, people need to look at the big picture rather than getting up in the small skirmishes that people try and create, whether they're politicians or journalists or whoever else they are, or people of different agendas. They're not looking at the big picture. Thank you, sir. Just um, for this tsunami threat, I know this is a whole of government approach. Um, can you please confirm why the advisory from NDMO was delayed? and released at uh, 7.32 p.m. when the volcanic eruption started at about 5 p.m.? Well, there were, there were two alerts that were given out, um, not just NDMO. Uh, I've got the copies of the two. Uh, there's one from the Mineral Resources Department uh, that was given out and one from NDMO. Um, obviously, you know, uh, there is, um, they need time to do the assessment. Um, they do need to liaise with a number of agencies. Like I said, they were liaising with people in, in New Zealand, uh, in Wellington, where there's a you know, seismic uh, sort of uh, assessment place um, where they do have better systems of measurements. Um, and I think a lot of people already had been warned um, about it. So I don't think there's necessarily any particular delay that would have caused any uh, particular loss of life. But uh, the, uh, the, um, the messages have already gone out. So there, um, there were some uh, thunderic uh, sounds being heard this afternoon, which means that volcanic eruptions are still occurring again. Uh, can you just advise, um, what is your advice like to the people who still think that uh, maybe the w it's over or maybe there was years <coughs> to come? And the ministry, the, sorry, the mineral resources has just confirmed that there's just another one at 9, 10 p.m. So, um, so what's the question? Your advice to people who still think that it's not a... Please uh, listen to the advice on radio. Uh, the ministry, uh, the responsible military, ministry, sort of mineral resources, uh, they are the ones with the close contact with the Wellington and various other international agencies to do these assessments. As you know, that uh, it requires very sophisticated equipment to be able to predict these things as to when they will occur. Nobody expected what happened in, in Tonga to happen. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, it's not our ability to say, please, you know, this will happen in the next hour. Uh, that's something that the experts will tell us. So this is why it's critically important to keep your radio on and the, all the messages that's uh, needed as and when it's needed will be given out on the radio. So just um, can you confirm if it's like um, government's uh, stand, if people, I know the Minister for Disaster Management has confirmed this, that uh, people, when they go into evacuation centers, they need to take food with them, that at least last them with two days or 48 hours. Can you confirm is that if that's like government stand on people who are moving to evacuation centers? No, look, the, the, the statement was made to say if you have the ability to, because sometimes when people move to evacuation centers, for government to be able to bring relief supplies if the roads are all shut off is very difficult to do so. So in the event that you can take some food stuff, so you can take it with you. We're not saying it's a strict policy, only then we will give you food. But it's just a standby arrangement. Because sometimes people are, you know, in an evacuation center and you cannot get there. The bridge may have been washed away. The roads may have been washed away. It may take a bit longer. It may take a day to get there. So in the meantime, if you have had the ability to take something with you, then please do so. It's not a strict must. You must do that. Otherwise, you'll be punished or something. And please don't make it out to be that. Uh, good evening, Attorney General. My name is Wati from the Fiji Sun. Uh, yesterday, uh, People's Alliance Party uh, had a press conference when uh, the, party leader, uh, the party leader was asked about the education. He said the free education was, 
was uh, started by him. I would like to get the government's comment on that. Well, look, uh, Rambuka has a habit of talking a lot of nonsense nowadays. I think he's trying to get a lot of traction, as I said. He's made some really superfluous comments. Uh, he did not introduce free education. I don't know how many of you uh, would have been to school when you had to pay school fees. I'm sure most of you would have had to pay school fees when you went to school. And that was after he was in government. So he did not introduce free education. It's a lie. The second question is the opposition is saying that they will get <coughs> WD back. I'd mm -hmm. like to get a comment on that though. Well, I, <coughs> I read somewhere that the rationale was that if PWD was there, then they would be able to do things quicker. I think really, you know, it is quite a, a huge uh, insult uh, to the uh, workers of FRA, um, EFL, in Water Authority of Fiji to say that. I mean, I think uh, there was that sort, uh, statement came from Sodelpa. I think because uh, NFP and Narumbe and others were making statements, Sodelpa felt like they had to make a comment. And this is the trend that we have seen. I mean, it's quite preposterous to say that. The, the technology that's being used now, the methodologies of you know, constructing, engineering has changed significantly. And these young men, uh, you know, men and women of these agencies, utility agencies, are well versed in that. But the reality of the matter is that, as we've highlighted, we've had 13 cyclones since 2016. And we have been inundated, actually, with climatic events, as the world has been. We've got cyclones in, you know, oh, uh, floodwaters in northern Queensland, you have floods in the USA, snowstorms, you have bushfires, all sorts of shenanigans are taking place, climatically speaking all over the world, even those advanced countries, their utility companies are finding it hard to deal with. Some of those places have gone without electricity or water for weeks. And, and so here we have a political party that wants to get some kind of airtime saying let's bring back PWD and fix things up. And how does that fit in overall in terms of the, the, the cost of government, you know, the, the uses of private sector because as we've seen that by using private sector through these agencies also, we've seen greater efficiency in the way that we respond to disasters. Be able to engage with the private sector and use the new technology. So, I mean, it's, it's quite ridiculous for them to say that. So just uh, my, my last question is, uh, Agni Deo Singh has been saying that teachers should not have been told to go back to school <coughs> while the schools were shut because of the, the cyclone. Can I be able to get your comment on that? Sorry, I, I didn't get your question. Oh, Agni Dao Singh has been saying that teachers should not have been told to go back to school while the schools were shut because of the cyclone. Would like to get your comments on that? <coughs> Nobody was asked to go to school or to work when the cyclone was, was, you know, was happening. I mean, most of the shops, businesses were all closed down. Uh, government offices were closed down, etc. So nobody's asking any of the teachers to go when the cyclone was there. But of course, the teachers, uh, in preparation for school, the teachers do go back to school to prepare for classes. So I cannot see what the problem is with that. If, if their safety is there, um, you know, teachers have been vaccinated. The school environment has uh, got all the COVID safe protocols. They have to prepare for classes if the classes are going to be on. So I cannot see what is, you know, what is the problem with that. I suspect the only reason why he's doing that is because I'm informed Agni Deo Singh is going to stand as a candidate. He's trying to get their votes. I mean, this is what's happening. Unfortunately, in this country, this is precisely what is happening. Most of these politicians are coming out and having all these sort of, you know, what I call the silo statements on silo issues just so they can appeal to some kind of vote bank. That's precisely what's happening. It's not a holistic look at what's happening in the country, the socioeconomic impact of it, the well-being of the country, what's the long-term view. None of these political parties or politicians have actually presented a wholesome policy statement. Nor have they presented an alternative budget. So that's probably him just politicking because he wants to be a candidate. Yeah. So just on the same issue, a number of parents have contacted us. They showing their concerns. This is just on the security and safety of their children. Mm. Um, since uh, the minister, sorry, the permanent secretary of health has also confirmed that teachers and students have also tested positive in schools. Mm. Uh, they are concerned about this uh, information, sir, just um, in terms of, I know the Minister of Education is not here, just in terms of um, the concerns that these parents um, are raising with us, mm. they're also asking if uh, maybe the Ministry of Education can uh, maybe delay 
the, um, the reopening of schools, maybe just uh, in time for the uh, five-year-olds to 12-year-olds to get vaccinated? So, and, okay, sorry, go on. And since uh, the Minister for Education also highlighted like some schools in um, UK and uh, other countries are also opening, she mentioned that it's going to open in February. Why don't we just move it to February and let the vaccines come in for five-year-olds and 12-year-olds mm -hmm. and then maybe open schools? Uh, I don't know if you were here for my statement. I did say the schools aren't opening at the moment, but the schools will open. Uh, and once we have this uh, weather patterns will go away, once the, you know, the tsunami warnings, these volcanic eruptions, so of course the schools aren't going to be op uh, open until then. But in, in terms of the reopening of the schools, uh, again we have had, you know, uh, we are working with WHO, we're working with UNICEF, Ministry of Health, uh, to ensure that, you know, that these COVID safe measures are being put in place. So the children actually do have a COVID safe environment. Um, they will, as you also, I mean, I don't want to get into the sort of health specifics because again, you're kind of asking what I call a silo type based question. Because as you know, the Omnicron in respect of its um, uh, effect on the individuals, the, it's, the, it has not been as severe as you know with all the other strains, the previous strains. Uh, and uh, so it has not been as dangerous. Uh, you cannot say, for example, if that one person has, one teacher has uh, COVID, therefore you should shut down entire school system. Uh, there may have been some cases where people may have tested positive. Some of the numbers that have been highlighted, in fact, have been inflated. So the, the fact of the matter is that the schools will open. And as you said, that we'll announce the opening school, uh, the date of the school opening later on. Hello, I'm from uh, Fiji One News. Um, um, with the surge in cases of uh, uh, Omicron in our community and uh, tropical cyclone Cody, with its devastation, hit, uh, uh, hit the country and affect a lot of people. Um, and with our people who need assurance during this difficult time, and our leaders were not on the ground, the Prime Minister and the Acting Prime Minister, um, you know, our people should be having confidence in, in their leaders. Do you think you have some form of obligations and was response actively delivered to affected communities on time? Can you ask your question? I know you're reading it, somebody probably wrote it for you, but it's a long-winded question. Can you tell me what, do you, what are you asking? I'm, I'm asking, sir, about the people and how yeah. they have confidence in their leaders. And this is an uh, uh, election year. And with our leaders' absence on the ground, during natural disasters, yeah. I just want to ask, do you have some form of obligation? So you think confidence should only be there during election year? Uh, sir, um, because uh, it was a really tough time for the country. During uh, we have faced tougher times. Cyclone Winston was a lot tougher. We had, we have COVID-19 we had, as well. So. Yeah, but it was tougher too. We have COVID, but the uh, Omicron variant, as you know, has very low uh, hospitalization rate. That's what you have not mentioned very low levels of hospitalization rate. The experts are saying it. Dr. Fong is saying that. I'm sure you've had colle colleagues who have had COVID-19, but they've not been hospitalized. People are having catching COVID-19, they're staying home and they're coming back to work. So I, d I do not know what you're saying. Uh, the acting prime minister was here. Inia Siraratu was the acting prime minister um, uh, when the cyclone came, was here. So. We've had acting prime ministers before. All the ministers were out. The acting prime minister was out. All the other respective ministers were out. So how is that in any way undermining government's performance? I think you're just blowing it out of proportion. So I was just asking about the confidence of... Well, who, who is lacking confidence? Are you lacking confidence? The public said... No, the public have said to us otherwise. We get many positive responses from people saying, thank you for the rations. Thank you for clearing up roads. We're getting text messages. Our culvert's gone. Our road's gone. It's been fixed up. People are sending us messages saying, thank you, great. I've got now water in Kulu Kulu. I've got water here. I've got water there. Uh, have you used some kind of public poll to say the public confidence went down? Is that what you're basing it on? Or is this simply some kind of conjecture on your part? There's just a lot of uh, uh, co uh, conversation on social media. Oh, about social. That. I've also had a lot of positive conversation on social media too. Maybe he's going to the wrong sites. Thank you, sir. Thank you.
So just another question from me. Uh, I understand that uh, we've had a lot of uh, great interest from uh, tourists when uh, we were opening our borders. Mm -hmm. And uh, now with the recent events that we've had, uh, maybe you can just tell us uh, how is the confidence like and the interest from uh, tourists? Look, a lot of tourists have actually, generally February, as you would know from the tourism sector, even before COVID, is what we call the lull period. People kind of taper off. Um, uh, you know, for example, the, the, the Hilton I know, oh, I shouldn't name hotels, but you know, various hotels I know, um, they are just below 50%, some are over 50%, some are sitting at 30% uh, occupancy rate, uh, and you can't expect that this time of the year. Um, but also you have to see the, the travel safe countries, you know, mainly Australia and America, that we're getting a lot of tourists from. What's the situation in their respective states? Uh, what kind of rules do they the states have in the respective country in terms of people going back. So you, 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 know, you, can, you have to view it from that perspective also. Um, but the interest is still there. There's a lot of forward bookings also. A lot of people are booking into May, June, uh, July. Uh, some have booked, I've seen some of the bookings uh, way down to October, November of, of this year. Uh, but you know, th there's no doubt that uh, because of the Omicron variant globally, uh, that you know, people um, sometimes would perhaps you know be le less uh, you know um, willing to travel. Uh, but uh, as far as we are concerned, this is a bit of a lull period. But we need to continue to ensure that the COVID-safe measures and protocols we have put in place are well adhered to, because that's what's going to lead to confidence. So at one of the hotels yesterday in the Western Division, I saw a lot of uh, tourists walking around. They were swimming. You know, they were feeling good about it. Um, and so, you know, in that respect, if, if we have the COVID safe measure in place, the protocols are in place, we're doing the testing at the right time, etc., we're adhering to it, they recognize the country's high level of vaccination, uh, then of course they will, you know, um, they will, they'll feel a lot more eager to travel to that particular country and that's what we need to maintain. Of course, if you're going to have volcanic eruptions in the region, people will feel a bit hesitant to travel too, so you expect people to perhaps defer their holidays. So those, these, those things all have, are, are factors that have an impact in the traveling public's uh, you know, um, willingness to travel. Maybe just one last question from me. Uh, just, uh, I understand that you've given out uh, our economic outlook for the year. Um, the World Bank uh, statement yesterday highlighted that global economic growth is expected to decelerate, mm -hmm. causing uh, what many economists call the inequality pandemic. Uh, in the case of Fiji, what, what is your comment on that? Well, I think, the, uh, as you know, that there is prediction for it to accelerate. And some of the deceleration uh, comments that have been made by the President uh, uh, Malpass uh, has been in respect of the Omicron variant. Uh, because, as you know, that in some of the countries, like in Europe, they had an increase in cases uh, in generally some of the other countries, too, where people are uh, less, like I said, willing to travel. So that has an impact or less... Uh, um, the, the impact that has had on, for example, not just the Omicron variant, but generally in terms of, for example, freight. As you know, the cost of freight globally has increased quite significantly. Uh, as we've said in earlier statements, that a lot of people talk about, you know, the cost of goods going up. Uh, the major component of that, in fact, in, in some cases, the only component of that is because the cost of freight has gone up. Uh, we have seen, for example, things like fertilizer costs. I think there's a, one of the newspapers did an article on that. Uh, China produces 90% of the world's fertilizer. The fertilizer uh, rate is actually is almost doubled now. So whereas, uh, you know, um, a sugarcane farmer, the cost of a bag of fertilizer was about, uh, I think it's about 42 or $44 a bag, which government used to subsidize and farmer used to pay only $20. The cost of that bag of that fertilizer will now go up to $80. So almost a 100% increase. So there are sort of those areas that will have an impact, you know, throughout the world. Um, and so we just have to watch and wait as to see what, what happens. But from our perspective, like I said, we have to continue to do the right things. And the right things are that we're in a good space in one of them, which is actually making sure that we are vaccinated, fully vaccinated or close to being fully vaccinated, getting our younger people also to be vaccinated. Uh, ensure that your economy is still open up. You know, I met a couple of the uh, ministers, for example, in, in, in Singapore, and we talked about how, they even talked about how the economy needs to o continue to open up. Because it does have a long-term effect on people's livelihoods. If the economy does not open up, there's going to be a risk in anything you do. 
Anything in, li in life is a risk. How you mitigate those risks is what is critically important. You're going to walk across the road when you finish this, uh, this particular uh, you know, media conference. There's a risk to you crossing the road. How you mitigate that risk is by looking left and right, making sure there's no traffic when you cross the road. So that's what it's all about. It's about mitigating those risks. Risk will be there. So how do we do that? Our first you know, shield was making sure that most Fijians get vaccinated. Try and achieve 100% vaccination rate. That allows you to then open up. That ensure, makes you attractive to other people so they can come to your countries, not just about tourism. People going to work, being productive. So those are the sort of you know, measures that you need to take. The economy needs to open up. We need to adhere to various protocols. We need to adapt, adapt and adopt new technologies to be able to be, you know, participate in this new normal. So those are the things that we are obviously uh, we are putting in place and that we need to understand. Uh, Mr. Kayum, with your, thank Ms. you Sayed for Kayum, the... Actually. Sorry, Ms. Mr. Kayum. Sayed Kayum, forgive me. Uh, with regards to your economic outlook uh, and basically your general overview about uh, you know, what's ahead of us, uh, are we going to have the elections this year and do you have any idea when the dates might be? The uh, uh, constitution provides that the government must serve the elected government must serve at least three and a half years, but no more than four. So there's a six-month window in which you can have elections. The first date that the election can be held is the 9th of July, or thereafter, any, any Wednesday, up till, I think it's early January 2023. So that's the window where elections can be held. Of course, we're not going to tell you what date the election will be held, nor, nor have we ourselves determined what date the election will be held on. Um, so with regards to the Prime Minister again, um, you said that he had gone away for medical treatment a week ago. Why wasn't the public informed then? You were aware of questions and allegations, speculation. Why, wasn't, why didn't the government feel the need to inform the people of Fiji that their leader uh, might be getting serious medical treatment and was abroad? No, like I said, again, if you listen to my statement, he went for medical review. And during the review, they said he had to have this surgery. Urgently, that's why. And why wasn't the changeover of who is prime minister, who's leading, um, uh, communicated to the public like you normally would? No, we always have done that. Whenever the prime minister is gone, we make the acting appointment. That always gets gazetted. You need to read the gazette. Hmm. Usually you follow it with a formal announcement as well to the media not, at least. No, not necessarily. That's your conjecture again. Thank you. Hmm. Let's not make a big deal out of this. That's what you people are trying to do. You're trying to find something where there's nothing to find. So just uh, like you've highlighted earlier, this year is a big year for Fiji, elections year. Can you confirm if the supervisor of elections has resigned? Again, you see the, the, the point of them. No, he has not resigned. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So you had mentioned uh, you were in Singapore. What was the agenda of the travel? I went for my medical review. Any more questions? Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thanks.